Well, welcome everybody to the Ultrasound Grand Rounds this week. Pretty excited to continue on as we trudge through the year. And that maybe trudge isn't the right word. We're kind of exiting the winter season and beginning the spring season, at least officially on the calendar. And I don't know about you, it's starting to maybe slide up in the terms of the temperatures here, um, but we do have some rain today. But anyway, with that being said, it's a great day to hunker down and just learn some ultrasound. And so today we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Dr. Dr. Catherine Lang did a great job of introducing us to the whole concept of bedside ultrasound, and we're going to build from there today and really just talk about some cases and see how this modality can be particularly helpful for us uh, as we see patients at the bedside, whether it be in the ED or up on the wards. Uh, or in the units. So with that being said, we're going to move on over to the slide set here, and we're going to talk about renal ultrasound cases. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So um, the first thing that we kind of want to go over a little bit, and it, it, we're going to just do a brief summary, and I don't want to spend a ton of time here because Catherine did such an amazing job last week. And if you haven't had a chance to yet, go to our YouTube channel, Metro Health Emergency Ultrasound, and look at the video from last week. I just posted it this morning um, of Catherine's talk about renal ultrasound. Uh, if you want to kind of get filled in on the what we talked about last week. But for this week, uh, we're going to do a brief summary um, and then go into some cases. And so really, as we think about renal ultrasound, we have a couple goals in mind uh, that we want to achieve with this particular study, right? And if you look at the books, right, if you look at the textbooks like um, you know, for bedside ultrasound, the main goals of renal ultrasound are twofold. One is to assess for obstructive uropathy, right? So is there hydronephrosis in this kidney? Yes or no. Uh, and then number two, evaluate for kind of bladder volume slash urinary retention, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different variations on the theme that we can apply as we think through these two big subheadings of what are our goals, um, but it really kind of gets us pointed down the right direction. And what gets us into this pathway is present patients presenting with potential urinary complaints like flank pain, like hematuria, inability to avoid, things like that, right? And so these are the kind of the main things that we're going to be looking for um, as we scan these kidneys. And then as we kind of flip over to the machine itself, um, this is obviously a normal kidney, right? Normal uh, right upper quadrant kidney. And we're going to see this kind of architectural structure, right? So this is going to be the kidney on the right-hand side. It's going to be just in, just underneath the liver. Um, and we have the very hypoechoic renal cortex, right? And then we have inside of it, the renal pelvis which is going to be the hyperechoic um, you know, area. And a couple of things to note here, just to kind of point out some typical common features, your kidney itself should be relatively hypoechoic to the, to the liver and same on the other side to the spleen. If it's not, then you need to start asking your question, yourself some questions as to why. And then uh, it should have kind of a generally homogeneous, um, you know, echo echogenicity essentially throughout the entire cortex. It shouldn't be tons of variation, right? And it should have that C shape, right? It should be, if you're scanning right in the middle of the kidney, right? You should have that opening of the cortex as the pelvis kind of emerges from that center of the kidney and kind of that's where the vasculature and the, the ureters will, will enter and or exit from the, from the renal pelvis, right? And so that should be kind of a normal architecture of a kidney. Now, when we talk about hydronephrosis, we're talking about putting fluid inside the collecting system of the kidney. And so if you think about it, right, all the, the machinery of the kidney happens in the renal cortex, right? Uh, it's the part that gets the nephrologist really, really excited. And then all the collection, right, happens in the pelvis. And this is what gets the urologist really, really excited. Um, and so what we see on the left here is we see a patient with mild hydronephrosis, right? And it's progressing all the way to severe hydronephrosis on the far right. And as we know, this isn't three discrete things. I mean, we cat categorize it in three discrete ways, uh, but it's certainly not three discrete entities. It's a, uh, it's a spectrum or continuation um, of, of pathology, right? But we have to put some kind of boundaries around a category so we can, we can communicate to one another. And so on the left, again, we see the mild hydronephrosis, which is going to be represented by a small amount of fluid in the collecting system, right? So you can start seeing that collecting system. The moderate, we have you know, a, a further arborization of the fluid inside that collecting system, right? It distends into um, the further reaches of the renal pelvis. And at the severe end, we start seeing obliteration of the normal renal pelvic architecture, right? Just this massive amount of fluid um, inside inside that kidney. And so um, oftentimes, like in my reports, as I'm, as I'm writing the results, you know, I'll say, if it doesn't clearly fall within one of these boundaries, we'll say, hey, look, this has got mild to moderate hydro, this has got moderate to severe hydro. Uh, but it gives us an example of kind of the spectrum that we're going to be noticing 
as we scan these patients. And from there, right, with this hydronephrosis, that's going to really help us start narrowing down what does this scan mean to me, right, or mean to the patient. And that's really the key, right? We, the whole point of renal ultrasound isn't necessarily to be able to do a study, but to be able to make meaningful and impactful decisions on patient care. In fact, I was reading something yesterday. It was a really good study. Um, it was published by um, the guy who runs the Nephrop pod, or um, Twitter channel, and he's got a Nephropocus website, but he did a basic pocus ultrasound for nephrologists uh, article. And he made some really, really interesting comments about the physical exam. And he said, a lot of the physical exam findings that you may rely on are, are reliant on kind of late to end stage disease processes, right? And that's where the, ben the ultrasound can have some huge benefit is we have patients who have symptoms, right? Who haven't manifested to late stage that we can now pick up earlier with our ultrasound. Uh, and so it's the ability to take these findings and then translate them into clinical decisions that really defines the field of how point of care ultrasound basically makes the physical exam better, right? And then how point of care ultrasound differs from consultative ultrasound in that we get to make those, those decisions in real time, right? At the bedside, we get to directly clinically correlate as we do our scanning, right? And so with that in mind, right, we have this hydronephrosis that we've identified on the patient. And now we have to decide what does this mean for us, right? And so the first question that we then have to process through is, okay, is this on one side or is this on both sides? Because it, it really opens up a you know, while somewhat similar, somewhat overlapping differential diagnosis, it really you know, opens up a, a differential diagnosis that can be unique for each side, right? So if you have unilateral hydronephrosis, right, we're thinking through, okay, there's some obstruction somewhere between the kidney and the bladder, right? And so it's either going to be some intrinsic obstruction, right? So we think about that in the context of renal stones versus some extrinsic compression, uh, whether that be from, you know, a tumor or mass, whether that be from, you know, a, a large AAA that kind of emphasizes one side or the other, or there's even some case reports uh, or some reporting of pregnancy causing some hydronephrosis. You can get a little bit of hyd uh, hydronephrosis off of your pregnancy uh, as the uterus gets larger and it starts compressing the ureters it's coming down. So you got to think through, okay, what's going to cause it to be unilateral versus bilateral. And then on the bilateral side, okay, we have to think, okay, there's an obstruction that's going to be probably somewhere in the bladder or distal to the bladder, right? Because if you think about it, how do you obstruct both um, both ureters? I mean, I suppose, and I put this on first, right? I suppose you could have a super duper large, you know, compressive mass. So whether it be the pregnancy we talked about earlier, or a super duper large AAA or some massive intra-abdominal cancer or whatever, I suppose that could do it. But more commonly, what we're going to find is some urinary outflow obstruction, whether it be uh, urinary retention for for whatever reason, um, you know, or inability to avoid because you just can't get things to come out the, you know, the, the distal portion of the urethra. So uh, that is going to be the thought process as we work through our hydronephrosis question. And that leads us to really goal number two with our ultrasound. And that is to evaluate the bladder, right? And to say, is this bladder large or is it small? Um, can we completely void this thing, right? And so this is an example of a large bladder, it's about 300 cc's. And if you scan me, uh, or you or anyone for that matter, you know, after they've been holding it for a good long time, you may find something like this. In fact, I've often thought it'd be kind of fun uh, just to kind of scan myself on shift uh, at various different stages of I haven't used the restroom yet and see at what degree of pain or what, what volume of bladder correlates to what degree of pain uh, have not yet done that. Um, the fact that I'm mentioning is probably a little bit TMI for a lot of people. Um, but the point is this, right? If you hold for a while, you're going to get a, a distended bladder, right? And it's going to, um, and you may have pictures like this, but where this becomes a problem is if when you try to go or when your patient tries to go and they can't get it all out, right? And now this is what you have. That's, that's a problem. I mean, that's a definition of urinary retention. So uh, this is really helpful when you scan patients within about 10 minutes of their attempt to void to see how much residual do they have? And do we have some obstructive process or some inability, you know, neurologic, medical or, or medication induced or whatever that's causing them to, to not be able to void. And so um, just some helpful things that you may run across uh, as we kind of work through those two different goals for bedside ultrasound. With that said, that's kind of a, a basic summary. I mean, if you want a more elaborated version, probably a little bit more eloquent version, um, like I said, check out last week's uh, video that we just posted. But with that said, and with that context in mind, we're going to dive into some cases because what can be helpful is not just say, okay, great, I can scan. There's kidneys there. Wonderful. Yeah, it looks like a kidney. 
The question is, how do we then make this, this data meaningful, right? And sometimes that knowledge translation piece can be the hard part as we're trying to, to do these scans, right? And so that's why I want to utilize three cases in particular that really help us illustrate the thought process and how we look at these studies and how we get from point A to point B and make a diagnosis for the patient or, or make some meaningful impact on this patient. And so with that being said, case number one uh, is going to be, let's say, um, and this is, I mean, these cases are, are loosely based off of patients that we've actually seen in our practice, but they've obviously been obscured for HIPAA purposes. Um, but this is going to be a young female, right, who presents with left-sided flank pain. Um, and so let's just say they're about 15 years old. They got left-sided flank pain. They present to your clinic. They present to your emergency department. Um, sorry, Z, they probably don't present to your ICU with this, this finding without some other things. Uh, so you may have to bear with us for a moment. We'll get to some cases that you may enjoy in, in a minute. But let's say they present, you know, to a frontline physician with left-sided flank pain, go, right? What are you going to do, right? And so, you know, obviously we need to rule out the pregnancy because that's going to have huge implications on how we work up this flank pain. But we're going to say that HCG is negative, right? Um, we're also going to say that there's no evidence of UTI on this urinary or this on this UA. Uh, and so we wheel in the bedside ultrasound, right? And we see on the, the left-hand side, we see the, the right-hand side of the patient and their image, right? And this is going to be uh, a normal kidney, a normal right kidney uh, on this particular patient. But if you look at the image on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see something that looks dramatically different, right? You see that renal cortex, that kind of that C-shaped thing. Inside, you have the hyperechoic renal pelvis. And then inside that, we see a whole bunch of anechoic stuff that's just not present on the right patient's right kidney or in the image on the left, right? Uh, and so this is by definition hydronephrosis, right? And this is unilateral hydronephrosis, right? Um, and so what we what we can see here is, I mean, if we want to put a classification on it, we can say moderate size uh, hydronephrosis um, on the left. And so if we go to an image, right, we can kind of scan through this and, and really convince ourselves that, yeah, that's legit. You can see it kind of coalescing, kind of forming that ureter as it, uh, it goes deep into the screen, but comes out of that kidney and heads towards the right-hand side of the screen, which would be towards the patient's feet here. Um, and so this is left side of uni left unilateral hydronephrosis. And so I think what we have to say is on this patient, right? We have a 15 year old young female who's got unilateral left hydro. And, you know, it's going to bring up the question is, is there intrinsic compression or intrinsic obstruction or is there extrinsic compression, right? And so, you know, you can say, hey, one of the next things we can do is we can CT scan the patient, right? See, I, I think kind of the elephant in the room that we're trying to rule out, at least most common things, common things being common, that we can work on the esoterics if we rule it out, is does the patient have a renal stone? right? Um, and CT scan would obviously be our next choice. But again, we have a young 15 year old female who we want to try to do some radiation sparing to the best of our ability, uh, because of the long life expected to see in the, the risk of potential malignancy down the road. And so let's move on down, right? Let's move down towards the pelvis and towards the bladder and see, is there anything that we can add to this to really hone into why the patient has this left unilateral hydronephrosis, right? And so if we go down to the uterus, right, in the bladder, you can see uh, just to the left-hand side um, of, of center is the uterus, right? And the right-hand side is the, the urinary bladder. And if you look right at that distal ureter, we see a hyperechoic structure with just a touch of shadowing behind it, right? And you can see it right about, let's see, right there, okay? And that's going to be the patient's renal stone, right? And I thought this one is an interesting case because... In this patient demographic, right, I'm not expecting to see kidney stones, right? I typically see them a little bit older. Um, and so it's kind of an unusual presentation. But yet we have findings of left hydro that are pretty decently obvious, right? And we can scan down, we see they have a, a renal stone. And so now all of a sudden, we've diagnosed this patient with left sided unilateral hydronephrosis and left flank pain with the kidney stone, right? And so we've completely obviated the need for a CT scan, we've saved them the radiation uh, in this particular patient, right? And we may not always get this lucky. Um, but I think if we can start doing this, and if we can start bending that curve of how many patients need scans, um, we can start having a meaningful impact, not only on patients, but also on the, the utilization of healthcare resources here, um, you know, as we are, are kind of the gatekeepers of that. And think about it from this perspective. I mean, obviously in the ED, I have, and I'm basically in a well-resourced ED, I have, I have all the resources I could want, right? I could consult people, I could get whatever imaging modality I want. 
let's just translate to my institution to an outpatient clinic, right? To get a CT scan, you either have to do one of two things. You have to order said study that you have to have, which requires the patient to then go get the study, get it resulted. It comes back into some inbox and you have to re-communicate to the patient and all that takes time, all the patient's suffering, or you have to do the thing that we hate in the emergency department which is like, yeah, you don't have anything emergent, but go to the ER and they'll figure it out. Right. Um, and, you know, those of us who've been working in, you know, urgent cares and emergency centers, um, you know, we see this all the time, right? And so, you know, oftentimes it's it's super duper legit. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's frustrating. Um, and so in this situation, as a frontline provider, you have the opportunity to make the diagnosis at the bedside and save them even all that time. And the, t- you know, the time that the patient's going to spend in some waiting room, you know, waiting to get seen in the ED, right? Now you can expedite their follow-up um, you know, directly from the outpatient clinic. And so this is a huge win for this particular patient, right? Um, but there's one other thing that we can add onto this patient's um, diagnostics that really helps enhance and sometimes helps us visualize that stone. So if you're having a hard time seeing that stone, don't worry. We're gonna flip to the next slide here. And now let's look at this, right? So we have, let me get that thing started. Now we have our colored Doppler image, right? And you can see a lot of the vascularity inside the uterus but you see this artifact, right? This artifact that emerges from the stone, right? And just kind of goes down to the bottom of the screen. It's almost like a Doppler beeline, um, you know, to, to borrow some some um, some language from the, the lung ultrasound side of the world. Um, and this is called the twinkling artifact. You see this commonly with, with renal stones. You also see it commonly with other calcified structures. So uh, you can see this in the gallbladder. You can see this, you can see this with air too, little bits of air. Uh, it's called twinkling uh, artifact. Um, and so here's an article. Um, I thought it was helpful. I was looking it up a little bit last night, just kind of read or yesterday to read up a little bit more on it. Um, and so basically the twinkling artifact is, you know, it's, it's commonly seen, right? There's a couple of proposed mechanisms for why this may be beneficial uh, to, or why this may happen, right? One of them, one of the theories relies on the fact that, you know, coarse calcified structures, the way the, the echoes reverberate between the little coarse fingers of those and tentacles of the, of the, the stone causes this. Um, there's another one that's talking about some phase jitter uh, of the ultrasound beams as it's kind of hitting these things um, and interacting with the ultrasound beam. You know, I don't know. I'd probably have to d- d- or dig deeper into the physics of it. And I think those who are to do that probably aren't completely sure as to the exact mechanism, but it's a pretty reliable finding. Um, and in this particular study, this was published in Med uh, Medical Ultrasound in 2017, they basically reported that when you add twinkling artifact to obviously a curated cohort of patients where there was concern, right, they found that the sensitivity for twinkling artifact was 99%, right, and the specificity was 90% for stones less than five millimeters. Um, and while I think the numbers may be, um, you know, if you did more broadly applicable numbers to a more broadly applicable patient base, probably not going to hold up to the 99th percentile here. Um, However, I think it illustrates the fact that twinkling artifact is a decent way of trying to identify stones. And certainly in my practice, when I get down to the bladder, one of the things that I do routinely as I'm trying to see if I can find a stone there is just throw the Doppler right on the UVJ and see as I scan slowly through that ureter as it emerges into the bladder or comes into the bladder, does something just jump out with a twinkling artifact that kind of picks things up? Um, and you know, more often than not, I actually find it first as it twinkles, then turn the Doppler off and say, oh, there it is. Because sometimes these hyperechoic little stones, especially the little ones, uh, without a ton of hydro around them, can blend in, can be pretty nicely camouflaged with the other speckles of other structures around it. And so the twinkling artifact may actually help pull that out for you and maybe a little bit of a trick that you can use to, to try to find that stone. And once you found it, once you've measured it and you know where it's at, and you know that that's what's causing the hydro, we're good, right? We can discharge the patient, make sure they're adequately pain controlled, make sure they have no UTI uh, and send them on their merry way to follow up with the urologist for, um, for, you know, for expected you know, stone management, essentially. Uh, so that's case one, right? Now, moving on to case two, let's make it a little bit more complex, and we're going to throw uh, throw a Z into the mix here um, and, uh, and make a case that's a little bit more applicable to, to the ICU level of care, right? Uh, those certainly could be seen on the front lines in the emergency department or in, in, a, in a clinic if you're doing scanning, right? And so this patient is going to be presenting, let's just say it's a 50-year-old male, right, uh, presents with flank pain, right, unilateral flank pain and fever, 
right? And so this is uh, this is interesting, right? We add the fever element, so it makes it a little bit more complex. Uh, we're certainly worried about now an infection in in whatever is going on, right? Uh, because of the fever. And so we do a scan, right? And you see the left side of the kidney here, left kidney here, and we have this image, right? And so um, certainly looks a little bit different, but you know, most obviously we can see a little bit of hydro, but I think as we kind of go through this image, right? Let's stop it here and let's start breaking this image down and talk about what we're seeing. Cause it's actually quite a complex image, which has a lot of features that we can kind of pull out of it and information that we can glean, particularly from this image, even beyond the hydronephrosis, right? So first thing we look at the size, right? And again, at the bedside, I don't really measure all my kidneys. Um, you know, I eyeball it, I guess, and say, oh, you know, I guess it looks about normal, but it's really not a thought process that crosses through my mind on a routine basis. But for the sake of thoroughness today, let's let's talk about it, right? We look at a size, measures to be about 13 and a half centimeters long. For reference, you know, that 11 centimeters is, is, is normal, right? So it's slightly enlarged. I don't know what the significance of that is at this point, although we're talking about fever. So maybe is there something inflammatory we're talking about here? Who knows? Um, but that's the first, first aspect. It's slightly large. Second, right? And this is where it gets a little bit more interesting is look at the collecting system, right? You can see dilation of the collecting system. And if we put that on a scale of mild, moderate, or severe, we're kind of tipping into that moderate, uh, moderate hydronephrosis range, right? You can see in that superior pole of the kidney, kind of the middle portion of the kidney, the, the left, the right hand side of the screen, the, the inferior poles looking kind of kind of funny. Um, we'll kind of dig into that in a little bit, right? Um, but as we compare to the other side, right, we can definitely see there's something abnormal uh, as we look at the collecting system. It's enlarged, right? There's some obstruction, some unilateral obstruction in this kidney. So there we go. We got a little bit of a larger kidney. We have some obstruction. We got hydronephrosis, right? Um, but there's one other thing that we really need to be thinking about. And here's uh, an example of that hydro here. Um, but what is that right what is that that tealish bluish arrow pointing towards right and this is something that may not obviously jump out at us but really important for us to kind of keep our eyes out for right and that is echogenetic material that's layering inside this collecting system so hydro hydronephrosis by definition should be anechoic right it should just be black there should be no echogenicity or echoes inside that simple urinary fluid, right? It should just be simple urine uh, and urine by definition is anechoic. And we put things in there, we put echogenicity in there. Then we have to worry about something else inside the kidney besides urine, right? And so in this situation, we have dilated um, calyces with layering echogenicity, right? Which is going to push us towards that purulent or superative um, process, right? We can see this, you know, when we get pus, you know, or, or, or just debris layering out in there. And so this is going to push us down the, the route to make the diagnosis of pyo nephrosis, not just hydronephrosis, but pyo or purulent uh, hydronephrosis, right? And so by definition, if you wanted to look it up in some dictionary somewhere, and I think this is a composite definition, so don't go to Merriam-Webster's and expect to see the exact same thing here, um, but it's basically an infection of the kidney with purulent material within the proximal renal collecting system, and it occurs generally as a result of some form of obstruction, generally by renal calculi, right? Um, and this is really, really important, right? Because this is one of the few true urologic emergencies, right? You think about things that you need to wake up your urologist at two in the morning and advocate for your patient and say, no, 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 you can't just see them in the CDU tomorrow morning. You have to come in right now and see this patient. Uh, torsion, you know, that's a big one, right? And then pyonephrosis is another big one, right? Because this is a, um, it's, it's a very uh, severe process, right? It can lead to, it's got a high, um, you know, untreated, it's got a high morbidity and mortality and can really lead to pretty fulminant, you know, bacteremia and, and shock, right? Sepsis uh, in a large number of patients. In fact, it's kind of thought to be one of the one of the causes, or at least a, a need to rule out cause in patients who have urosepsis, right? Uh, and it's generally treated by drainage. You get Perknef tubes um, because you got to get that pus out of there without getting the pus. It's pus under pressure, right? Which is, you know, a double whammy for badness. Um, without getting that pus out of there, the patient's not going to get better, um, despite being on antibiotics, so you have to drain the drain the um, that collecting system, get them on antibiotics, and this is something you need to get the urologist in to to help you out with, right? Um, so that's that's pyonephrosis. But there's one other thing as we go back to this image, right? There's one other thing 
that we really need to, to take note of in this particular image, right? And the question is, do you see what's going on? It's a question mark to kind of tell you you need to think about it. Do you see what's going on in the center of the kidney, right? What do you, what do you see in the center of the kidney? And if your answer is not much, you're probably right. In fact, you are right, um, because that's what I wanted to point out to you. There's a huge thing that's causing a great degree of shadowing that you know emanates basically from the center of the renal pelvis of this kidney, right? Um, and this is an example of a large staghorn calculus, right? You can see that just basically just ginormous shadow uh, inside the kidney. I guess if you want it like a corollary in some other imaging modality, think about a wall echo shadow sign in the gallbladder, right? You, the, all you ever see is the shadow. Same thing here. The, the, the uh, calculus is so big that it's really obscuring your view of much of the renal pelvis, even though we can see kind of the distal portion of the renal pelvis. Um, this is basically the staghorn calculus, the, the nidus or the seed of this obstruction, right? That caused um, the patient then to, you know, go on to have pyonephrosis, right? And so this is a good uh, good case to kind of illustrate that point. Um, and like I said, you may see this in the in the floor or not the floors. You may see this in the you know the outpatient sphere, right? You may see it in the ED. And this is maybe some differential that you may need to consider as you have this septic patient. You know, let's say the ED admits to the unit a patient with urosepsis, and you're trying to figure out why does the patient have urosepsis. It's a great modality to take to the bedside and say, is there some obstruction with with hydronephrosis? I need to send it for percnef drainage, right? Um, if you want some literature to look into this more, this is a great uh, article. I read this yesterday um, from Diagnostics 2021. Uh, and basically, it's a, a pictorial review. So there's a ton of great images to really talk about pyonephrosis, right? How severe it is, how it needs to be drained, how it needs to be treated, um, and how ultrasound and CT um, are the, really the keys to making this decision or making this diagnosis. And the way I look at it is ultrasound, you know, you, you may be able to get there with your scan, right? Uh, it may also be the key that unlocks the door for you to mentally go down the route of get to, getting the patient to CT scan, right? And so however you get there, whether it be ultrasound or CT, you're doing a patient a, a great service, um, but definitely as you're evaluating the patients with undifferentiated flank pain uh, and fever or patients with urosepsis, this is something you want to certainly be looking out for. And as you basically as you're scanning anybody with hydronephrosis, is there, ask yourself, is there any debris inside that should make me worried about something further, right? So that's case number two. All right. And the final case that we're going to present here, and we'll maybe not go quite the full time today, um, but the final case that we're going to present is uh, a case of right upper quadrant, or excuse me, right lower quadrant pain with fever, right, and a heart rate of 140, right? So this isn't flank pain per se, um, but it's right-sided abdominal pain. We continue to add that fever to this element, uh, and they certainly are hyperdynamic, right? They have a heart rate that's elevated. And so this was a case that a resident and I worked up a few years ago, um, and it was originally presented to me as, hey, I'm concerned this patient has an appy, right? And so we went there to look and see if there is any fluid uh, in the pelvis that would suggest that the, the cause is in the right lower quadrant, kind of as we're waiting for a CT scan. But we ended up finding something else that was kind of unique. And I guess the fact that we're presenting on a renal day uh, really belies the fact that they didn't have an appendicitis, right? Let's see if we can figure this one out. So as we scan, here's the patient's right upper quadrant. So you see the liver, right? You can see the kidney. And, um, you know, as we're scanning through that kidney. And what you may notice, right, is that there's something abnormal about the echogenicity of this kidney, right? You can see that there is that hypoechoic cortex for most of the kidney, except for one part where it's actually just a little bit brighter than the surrounding um, cortex and a little bit brighter than the, the liver itself, right? And so we see a wedge-shaped um, thing inside that renal cortex, which really kind of strikes our attention. If you want to point some arrows around it to kind of point it out, there it is. Um, you can see this, this wedge-shaped um, artifact inside this renal cortex, which when we were scanning, hmm, that got my attention, right? We have a febrile, you know, hyperdynamic patient now with a wedge-shaped artifact on the side that they're having their symptoms, perhaps this is what's going on, right? And as we think through wedge-shaped artifacts in the kidney, really one of three things should be coming to mind. If we thought a little harder, maybe we could come up with, you know, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth. But, you know, for our purposes, kind of the top three things that we want to worry about is number one, is that an infarction, right? So they have something that's causing that kidney to be poorly perfused. Number two, is there an infection, right? So specifically pylo, 
um, <laughs> I'm going to mix up the terminology, pyelonephritis, not pyonephrosis, that we just talked about that one. And number three, is there some neoplasm or cancerous or tumor process that's causing this kidney to look abnormal, right? So those are the, the three big things, infarction, infection, and neoplasm. And what we did is we ended up scanning this patient, right? Um, and we got the CT scan to rule out the appendicitis. We got a UA, which was positive for nitrites, had lots of white cells. And the CT scan was consistent with our original hypothesis based on the original ultrasound is that we thought the patient had pyelonephritis. So it seems to fit. They got you know, abnormal urine, right? They got right-sided pain. They got an abnormal finding in the kidney. And lo and behold, this thing is an example of pyelonephritis. Uh, so that causes us to back up and say, okay, what are the test characteristics of, of ultrasound for pylo, right? And I have to say, pylo is typically not routinely seen on ultrasound. I had a couple of different adverbs in there. Um, now it's while it's not your modality of choice, it sometimes can be seen. And you know, as I was trying to find a good key study to say, oh, here's an example of the key literature that you need to see for pyelonephritis and ultrasound. I was really coming having a hard time coming up with it because while there's examples of various different flavors of pyelonephritis and case series, ultrasound is really not going to be your primary test. In fact, some places say that the sensitivity for of ultrasound for pyelonephritis is actually quite a bit low or quite low. And so I don't think you can go to the bedside and say, hey, look. I have this patient, it's got a normal kidney, therefore they must not have pylo, right? That you, you can't make that statement. Um, and while I don't know what the specificity per se of ultrasound for pyelonephritis is, because there's certainly other things that can cause this presentation in the right setting, right? You have a patient who's febrile, who's got right-sided pain, who's got the positive urines, and you see this finding, it does definitely all the all the things seem to fit and kind of point us towards that route. And what it did for us is it actually pointed us towards early on, hey, let's start thinking down the route of do they have a pylo rather than do they have appendicitis? And we're still going to rule out the appendicitis and confirm the pylo, uh, but we got us cognitively starting to work towards another route, uh, getting antibiotics going and starting to, to think how our workup needs to be affected by that. And then ultimately what our disposition needs to be and what our consultative process needs to be uh, in, in, the, in the process of working up this patient, right? And so this is a really interesting example, right, um, of, of pyelonephritis in um, in the patient, right? And so um, you can throw some color on there that may help you out. Um, you know, the problem is you're going to see decreased vascularity in the context of an infarction or in pylo uh, anyway. And so it may not be the game changer for you. But the other thing that you need to think through, right, and the, where all sounds going to be helpful is, are there any findings of a renal abscess, right? And so in this situation, no. Um, but again, keeping your eyes out for other secondary corner clues uh, may be helpful. So with that being said, those are three cases, right? And we're just going to back up and recap here a little bit that kind of help illustrate these two principles, right? How we use ultrasound to evaluate for number one, obstructive uropathy that was seen definitely in cases one and two, uh, where we could have that unilateral hydronephrosis. Um, and then secondarily, do we have any findings that would concern us for volume or bladder volume or, or urinary retention? We didn't really talk about any cases for that today. Um, but hopefully over the course of today's conversation, you're able to see how do we take these big principles that we're looking at and then start taking them step by step as we approach this patient and start narrowing down our differentials uh, to finally get to the ultimate diagnosis. And, and therefore, once you have the diagnosis, you can start initiating your appropriate management for the patient and get them on the road to recovery. So with that being said... Any questions uh, about today's presentation, comments uh, from those uh, who are listening about, uh, about the topic or, or anything that people want to say?